John Strome. During the last few years, I've traveled in some 60 countries around the world as a foreign correspondent, writing stories, taking picturing broadcasts from overseas. During that time, I've met a lot of interesting people, and I've seen a lot of unusual things. Always, it seems, there is a war, a famine, or a revolution going on somewhere on this world of ours. My latest trip was to Southeast Asia, certainly one of the most interesting areas in the world today, and I might add, vitally important to America. When we speak of Southeast Asia, we mean, in general, this area here, bordered on the north by China, over here on the west by India. Southeast Asia proper includes Burma, Siam, where they have canals instead of highways, and incidentally, its new name is Thailand, Indochina, Malaya, where most of our natural rubber, then these islands of Sumatra, Java, Bali, and these other islands make up the new nation of Indonesia. You know, it's an interesting thing that Singapore, down here at the southern tip of Malaya, is almost exactly halfway around the world from New York City. But the important thing, it seems to me, is the fact that you can get to Singapore in 72 hours from where you live in America. Certainly, passenger planes have put Southeast Asia in America's own backyard. Today, Southeast Asia stands at the crossroads of her history. The direction she travels from here is of vital importance to America. Much is at stake. The future of nearly half the population of the world hangs in the balance. To understand this crisis in Southeast Asia, it is important that we first know something of the peoples their problems, and their other Asian neighbors. Take India, for instance. India is a land of farmers suffering and semi-starvation. Agricultural methods are age old. The population is jumping at the rate of several millions a year. There never seems to be enough food to feed the people. Here's Jagdish, plowing with his oxen and wooden plow. He owns only three acres of land, has seven mouths to feed, so no wonder his children are always hungry. There are very few harvesting machines in India, only barefoot women like this, cutting the grain with little sickles a bunch at a time. And then the grain is thrashed by the age-old method of driving cows or buffalo over and over the straw on the threshing floor. It takes a lot of manpower to get the job done. You wonder that they produce enough grain to even keep alive. The answer is they don't. 300 million Indians are perpetually hungry. No fancy kitchen utensils in India, just stone, worn and polished with long, tedious hours of use. Indian cooking is a bit on the hot, spicy side. I had ample opportunity to sample it because the Indian housewife is no less hospitable than friendly homemakers the world over. The hope of India lies in its younger generation. In schools like this all over the land, they are gaining the knowledge of agriculture and industry that can mean new hope and new standards of living for the generations to come. This is a typical village in Pakistan. Pakistan is the new nation carved out of India. About 90% of Pakistan's population are farmers, like these folks here who have come to the village market. Although this ancient method of grinding oil seeds with camel power is picturesque, 
It is giving way to the advances of modern industry, which will give Pakistan's people a higher standard of living. This ancient water wheel, powered by oxen, raises water for irrigation. The gears are made of wood. Jars tied to the wheel pick up the water. While Pakistan has a long way to go, she is improving her agriculture and building such things as jute mills, which will make her a factor in world trade. And this is Siam. Its new name is Thailand. In Siam, the highways are mostly waterways. And these houseboats are home sweet home to many of the Siamese. Siam is a land of happy people and one of the greatest rice producing countries in the world. When you go to town in Siam, chances are that you paddle like this. This woman is taking her vegetables to market. Its canals make Bangkok picturesque. Its palaces make it one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Siam is a country where ancient and modern meet and mingle today. I was there during the cremation of their king and saw the customs of centuries enacted with oriental splendor. Here you see the golden urn containing the king's body being raised to its place on the golden chariot. The funeral procession was little short of spectacular. Hundreds of drummers, marching sailors carrying ancient symbols of state. When the Siamese sports fan goes to a boxing match, he expects to get a kick out of it. So does the boxer, for in Siam, as you can see, the boxers use both their feet and their fists. I saw six boxing matches this particular evening, and four of the fighters were carried out on stretchers. <laughs> This is Java, now part of the new nation of Indonesia. These people are planting rice. Conditions have been very unsettled since the new nation gained independence from the Dutch in late 1949. Indonesia has found it hard to grow enough rice to feed its people. And these are some of the finest tea gardens in all of Java. These girls are picking just the top tender leaves. They are the ones which make the best tea. Those baskets on their backs, of course, are for carrying the leaves which have just been picked. Traffic in Jakarta, capital city of Indonesia, is a weird mixture of old and new. Open canals run through the city of Jakarta where the people wash their clothes, take a bath, swim, brush their teeth, get water for cooking, among other things. Mama uses the steps down into the water as a washboard. Junior gets washed too. Every day is wash day along the Jakarta canals. They dunk their clothes, exchange gossip, and have a swim. It's a regular social event. And this is Ceylon, the island nation off the southern tip of India. Today, her standards of education and democracy are among the highest in the Orient. Rice is the staple food in Ceylon, like the rest of Southeast Asia. They cut it with little sickles as they're doing here. And they thrash it by foot. Workers like this help Ceylon produce about 100,000 tons of rubber a year. Selenese rubber was a vital necessity to the Allies in winning the war. There are some jobs that elephants can do even better than tractors. 
The boy mounts his elephant to clear an old rubber plantation for bud grafted trees which yield more rubber. Incidentally, the Rubber Research Institute of Ceylon is doing a lot in this field. Push over the tree, the boy tells his elephant, in elephant language, of course. Sometimes he has to tell him twice. But if the elephant pushes hard enough, the tree will go over. This is Malaya. This rubber tree grows in Malaya as well as in Indonesia and other Southeast Asian countries. It takes seven years before a rubber tree is big enough to be tapped. Tapping starts at daylight. Then, just before noon, when the latex has stopped flowing, each worker makes the rounds of the trees he's tapped. He uses his thumb to get the last drop of rubber from the cup. This small holder adds acetic acid to the latex to coagulate it into solid rubber. Half of Malaya's rubber is grown by small farmers with two to five acres, the other half on plantations like this. These workers are carrying the latex to the receiving stations. Workers dust with sulfur to combat leaf disease. Here's the manager of a large American plantation with his wife. The Rubber Research Institute of Malaya and similar organizations are constantly striving for more and better rubber. For example, take bud grafting to obtain maximum yields. This bud grafter peels the bark from the wood by holding it in his teeth. He trims the bud carefully, and then he strips the bark back from the seedling and inserts the high yielding rubber bud. He wraps a palm leaf around it to protect it and ties it up neatly with a string. It will be left this way for about four weeks. And then the bud grafter removes the wrapping. And if the bud shows green, a new high yielding rubber tree is on its way. 95% of the world's natural rubber comes from Southeast Asia, 40% from Malaya alone. This rubber worker looks at a picture of rubber roads. The Natural Rubber Bureau is now testing these longer lasting, safer rubber roads all over America. There are almost as many Chinese as Malays in Malaya. They were attracted here by higher wages. Chinese, like this tapper, are very industrious. They work on piece rates to increase their earnings. Incidentally, more than one half the population of Malaya depends upon rubber for a livelihood. Kids are kids the world over. This group of Malayan youngsters look very serious, but that's typical of the Malays. They sang a song for me. Most school children wear these white middies. It's a sort of school uniform. At recess, they play a hopping game that would be familiar to kids anywhere. Notice how healthy these children are. Health standards in Malaya are just about the highest in the Far East. And after a few years of plantation school, some of these youngsters we've just seen may go to the University of Malaya. These university students include a Malay, a Chinese, a Sikh from India, a Tamil from India, a Selenese, an English girl, and a Eurasian. This is one of the Malayan legislative leaders. Their legislature is similar to our Congress with all Malayan national groups represented. And this is Singapore Harbor, crossroads of the Orient. It is one of the busiest ports in the world. Ship workers scramble into a hole to unload the cargo. They bring their load down to the dock where it is piled for transshipment to all parts of Southeast Asia. At this open Singapore market, you can buy everything from a pickle deal to a straw hat. This is a colorful Hindu temple in Singapore. 
Each one of these images on the temple represents one of the many Hindu gods. Well, folks, that's my picture story of Southeast Asia. A story of peoples in transition. A story of raw materials, such as rubber, which we must have to keep the American economy going at top speed. And finally, a story of a valiant struggle against red terror. Our understanding of these peoples and their problems will help keep them on our side in the critical years ahead. This is John Strom saying so long, and thanks very much for joining me in this visit to Southeast Asia.